yo, yo, what is good, everybody? Welcome back to Mount Draftmore. Mount Draftmore. You know what it is. I'm Ben Jammin, and I'm joined by Matt and Dylan. Hello. What's up? Whoa. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And today we are joined by our special guest and returning champion, because he's won before. He's come back after winning. Corey Martin, how you doing? Happy to be back. Can't wait for it. Yeah, let's do this. Today we are drafting seminal moments in early history. Dylan, what is early history? So early history is any time before the fall, like with the fall of Rome and before. Okay. Um, but I like, can we cut it off? Like, is there a cutoff point in early history? Like 500. No, I mean like going back, back. Oh, oh no. Like, are we just going to go all the way back to the way, I'm, way back? I don't know. We'll just see how it goes. <laughs> we'll see. Corey, you can make you're a the compelling g- case. <laughs> yeah, if you can make a compelling case, is that fair? Corey, what do you think, Mr. That's well, not Yacht I mean, Rock? You have, you had, depending on who you're talking to, you have 100 to 200,000 years of, of humans being on, of Homo sapiens sapiens being on Earth. Um, not a lot happened for the first, um, you know, dozens of uh, millennia. So uh, I think we're going to kind of be pinched anyway into like, about 10,000 years ago to the fall of Rome. Okay, fair enough. Unless you, unless you guys start making some stuff up, but they can't prove. We'll see. <laughs> Lord of the Rings happened yeah. a long time ago. Hey, Star Wars was a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Far, right? far away. <laughs> and they had laser swords. Yeah. Think of the, the sand. Think of the things that we could do. Okay, before we start the draft, we need to know our order, which means we got to roll the dice. Oh, where is it at? Last time I threw it, it was on the floor. Jeez. Over by the bookcase. <laughs> oh boy, you see it? I've got it. Got All it. All right, here we go. Ooh, come on, baby, baby, baby. Oh, 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 oh! oh. oh. It's still rolling. Oh. What is it? Fuck! It's a one. All that for a one. <laughs> Diggity dang! Oh, All that for a one. Matt coming at you. That's right, I got a five. That's a five. That's a five. Corey, do you want me to roll for you? Uh, I don't want Ben to roll for me, that's for sure. Yeah, go for All it. All right. Oh, you might want me to roll for you because I'm a loaded dice now. Corey's Ooh. got a 24. Nice. And so now I've got a roll. Come on, Bessie. And that would be a nine. All righty. Damn, Corey coming out <laughs> with for the, the 24 first hit. Yeah. <laughs> you wasted the good roll on him. Uh, so Dylan with a nine. Corey's got the 24. He'll be going first, followed by Dylan. Man. Matt will go third. And then, Dude, yeah, boy, Ben Jammin is back. Why do back we roll so low? Wrap around. Yeah. Why do we roll what? Why do we roll so low? We rolled so low. It's, it's a low <laughs> roll kind of a day. Um, yeah. yeah, unless you're a special guest. All right, round one. Round one. Corey, you have the first pick, and we already know where you're going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we have, uh, we, we maybe briefly discussed this. Um, with the first overall pick, I mean, let's, let's, we use history uh, and recorded history and what, what helps us to understand what happened in the past. What, what was that, that turning point in which we have a recorded history? That's writing, folks. Mm. Uh, writing is a absolute turning point, um, starting off as a way to just simply record information, like, taxes and uh stocks and, and or stock like stocks of grain or whatever um like quantities of of things um and then later on uh not that far off but uh using it to write down laws so all of a sudden you could exert power over people you could record stuff you could communicate over time so even though like humans are unique in the fact that they have this ability to pass down knowledge from one generation to another like that collective learning idea from uh, world history from us all and big history, that collective learning is so important and writing only intensifies that. And when, once writing happens, you just see this like super sort of quick spiraling of advancement in human technology, uh, human innovation, uh, how societies function. So writing is, is a number one overall draft pick for today. Most definitely such a that's the McDonald's pick. It's how you organize society. Yeah, <laughs> is that writing? Yeah. So, Corey, are you talking about cuneiform writing? Yeah. Cuneiform so, as writing. far as just keeping keeping track of taxes, and then all of a sudden, it by doing that, it allows the state to 
have more power because then they could keep track of what people are doing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, even, uh, uh, which is an important thing. And, and even societies have other ways of doing that, but writing is a way for it to just be passed down from one generation to the next mm-hmm. to keep tabs on things. Yeah. It's, I, it's records. Yeah. It's records. And I think that's around the year 3000 roughly when that's developed, which is uh that's quite some time ago. Yeah. Go humans. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Nicely done. Yeah. That is McDonald's pick. <clears throat> Good pick Corey. Good one. Yeah. Uh, I love that. The pick. Look at the roll. I'm going to, I'm going to, that would have been probably my first or second pick. Um, it's hard. It's hard for me to decide because I think this is also a very key pick. It's the development of cities, which happened in the fertile, fertile crescent, same civilization as, as cuneiform being developed. Right. Um, you know, whether you're in a small town or you're in a big city, you're living a semi urban existence, right. At this point. And, um, the development of cities have greatly impacted the way we live our lives, the way we organize ourselves, um, developing grids, uh, developing like systems to get rid of our waste, get water to us, and then needing systems to organize ourselves because of this urban environment, right, leading to the development of writing. I think cities are a hugely important development. <clears throat> and they developed first... In uh, uh, they were built by the Sumerians at Tel Brak, Uruk, and Humalkar, um in Mesopotamia. So, the development of cities. Nice. What's the most ancient city in the world? Is that uh, at Damascus There's, or Babylon? It it's uh, either Tel Brak, Uruk, or Humalkar. I think it's okay. Uruk. I want to say. Is, gotcha. Yeah. Ancient Near East. Yep. Yep. All right. Yeah, and that's a pretty big one. How do you organize where, like, groups of people are living, working, existing? Yep. Right? And that's the basis for modern society. Because we all live in or around cities that are based off of carefully planned ideas about where natural resources are. So, oh, critically yeah. important. Yeah. And I think those are all river, river... We were talking about ancient river civilizations. Yeah. I think those are, like, those were along... What? The Tigris and the Euphrates. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like and then that. the yep. Nile. Yep. And then the Yellow River? Is that what it is in China? The Yangtze? Yep. The Yangtze, yep. yeah. Nice. Nicely done. It's a good one. Well, related to uh, what Dylan's picking, I'm going to pick something that is the basis for how they developed a lot of cities and a lot of different things, uh, which was the invention of math. Oh! Like, math is so incredibly critical to human civilization. Like, I hate math. I'm not a math guy. But... You have to understand its significance in terms of just where we've come as a species. Like math goes into just about everything, right? It it dates back to like, like three thousand or somewhere twenty five hundred, three thousand somewhere around there. But math is the basis for everything, from architecture to urban planning for the development of cities to how are we going to get these ships down the river to collect the resources? What's the most stable construction methods? What is just overall organization of life and society? It's a lot related to math even things like astronomy have derived like origins with mathematics themselves so being able to organize life through math math that's like incredibly significant and it's still cre- incredibly significant even today when you're talking about just everything that math involves we scoff because like math is hard and yeah it is hard but math is like one of the most important human innovations that dates back way 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 those like ancient greek mathematicians were some of the most brilliant people of all time so I don't think they were inventing math. Well, they, they were, were like discovering okay. it. They yeah. were discovering it. I was about to, to say, but we I had this like, discussion. But you I agree, with, I agree yeah. with you hundred yeah. percent. And I'm not trying no semantics or anything yeah. like that. I'm just like, I don't know if they created it. No, I but think, they, like, I think they, they like figured it out. Yeah. yeah. So that, that leads to the question. I think we explored on a previous podcast, man, someone hashtag that is does has math. Does math just inherently exist? Right. Does it always exist in the way it is, right? Um, is it always the same or can it take different forms? Like, is it always just, is it a physic? is a reality? Is it a reality of how the universe works? I mean, everything's derived from math, like life. So, but yeah, I agree with you. Like it, it's more of like the perfection and like understanding of like mathematics and using them in applicable ways to help organize life. That, I guess that's what I'll go with. Math, y'all. It's important. Mathematical. 
Ooh, fourth pick. I'm in the wrap around. Jesus. I know. You get two picks? I'm jealous. I, I know, and there's way too many things still to be picked, and I don't know how to prioritize what's more important, the early stuff or the late stuff. I'm not going to take 10 minutes like I did in the volume two of Disney. I'll just make my pick quick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I'm going to pick the creation of a calendar. Mm. Ooh, when was this? Uh, around 2500 BC, but there's also, there are some sites where there are earlier versions of calendars, 8,000 BCE. Um, but our the the calendar we associate most with the ancient era is Sumerians, the Sumerians' first calendar. And so this allowed them, like, agriculture happened way before this, but this allowed them to go agriculture on a large scale. Like, now we get to grow a lot more. Um, they're developing a 360-day calendar based on astronomy, the way the stars are moving. So they know when the seasons are coming. They know when they're going to change. They know how their harvests are supposed to work out. It allows them to be more efficient with their land, with what they're planting. And then civilization gets to grow from there. So all of us have important things for civilization. I think the calendar is just as important as all of the others. Because if you're not able to accumulate the resources, the food, to supply your cities and allow differentiation of jobs because the food's not being grown by everyone but just a smaller group, like, you're not going to have these other great things that come in the future. So, the calendar. Yo, I wonder if calendars helped organize religion a bit more. You know, with feast days, the solstice. I mean, the, everything was direct. Yeah, but I say, a, a, like, a lot of the most holy days in ancient, like, religions derived based off the solstice, which they would have figured out by doing the calendar. Mm -hmm. There's math again. Yeah. Yes. There you go. Yep. See? Math. You're welcome. I'm sure writing plays into that as well. You had to write the math down. You so got to write it go. down. Yeah. Got to keep track. Down, keep tabs. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Wow. Very nice. Good Very nice. first round. Damn. Great job, y'all. Do we got to get to a sponsor real quick, and then we'll be right back with the draft. Uh, the original chamber pot. Let's get to it. Mount draft more. Oh no, it's pitch black and you have a rumble in your tummy. Last time this happened, it was a disaster. You couldn't make it out of your room quick enough. Hello, I'm Silvana Empiricis, back again with another revolutionary good to change your life for the better. Stop shitting on the floor in the middle of the night with the original chamber pot. The original chamber pot is a man's hand deep with a large hole big enough to fit both your butthole and your phallus. Never again will you soil the hay or lay your remnants near the place of your slumber. No longer will you awaken to the foul odor of the midnight diarrhea. The original chamber pot is easy to use. Just squat over until fully relieved then empty in the morning. It's that easy. The original chamber pot is made from the God's Earth, tempered in the fires of Thebes and foretold by the Oracle of Delphi. Your waste will not penetrate the original chamber pot's designs. No more shitty pee pee in your chamber. Get your own original chamber pot today at the market. Mount Draft Moor. Round two. I'm in the wraparound, second pick, and going to go in a different direction here because it's going to be a while before I get another pick, so I'm going to pick philosophy, y'all. Mm -hmm. Whose philosophy? Greek philosophy, a Western philosophy. When? Uh, around 600 BCE, so you're looking at like Socrates, Aristotle, or Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Like those schools, like those schools of thinkers, dude. Aristotle's key for categorizing shit, even though he did a lot of it wrong. Well, we say wrong, but kind of fucked up, but with humors and whatnot. But his categorization was vastly important to the Western thought for thousands of years, dude. Uh, but, man, go ahead, Corey. I was gonna say you, you have um, with, with philosophy is an interesting one because, like, what Dylan is talking about, you have this bridge over to science. 
um, and just sort of like, how do we understand the world around us? But then it creates this other bridge over to religion because then you have this like sort of not, not tension, but with religion and philosophy, you know, philosophy can get into that metaphysical trying, trying to figure out like what's going on and, and can go into metaphysical ideas. Um, and that was happening all over the place, right around 500 where you have, even in the East, I know that you're talking about the West, but you have Confucius and Lao Tzu and um, Siddhartha, Buddha, all kind of coming up with ideas at the same time that you have those Greeks doing that as well. And there's a lot of bridges to belief systems, but also science trying to understand how things work. Yep. Also tangential, but y'all might find this interesting, listeners. Socrates, as a Greek philosopher, was found to be so annoying that he was forced to drink from a poison from a cup and yeah for himself. corrupting the youth yeah <laughs> and he was still doing his shit all the way up until he died yeah <laughs> he's a real one right yeah. there he's uh, sitting there talking to plato and plato is writing down everything that's happening Socrates like yeah i kind of deserve to die but do i deserve to die i think i might <laughs> but i might not <laughs> Yeah, those Greek philosophers were uh, some interesting dudes. Yes. I mean, across the whole spectrum, like you're saying, all of these different schools of thought. But, like, philosophy leads to creations of national colleges that are state-sponsored, right, and tied to these different religions. Mm -hmm. This little note that I have here is, is, like, the foundation of Islamic State Universities in 860 B.C. And then also, like, the Oracle of Delphi in 1400 B.C. So... Pretty important uh, for schools of thought and, you know, just the progression of thought into our modern age. Mm -hmm. Also connecting back to math, Pythagoras, mm -hmm. for example, yeah. right? Yep. So. Yeah, and the, the, that's the thing. It's like almost kind of a Venn diagram with a lot of those like higher changing the way you're thinking about life and society. They all overlap. They all have either some mathematics to them, philosophy to them, some a bunch of different things, religion, all the above. So mm -hmm. they were thinking a lot back then. That's for sure. Too much. And, and going back to his Islamic, and when you said Islamic State University, that uh, made me chuckle because I was all like, this Saturday Clemson takes on Islamic State <laughs> University. <laughs> um, ISU, but, let's go. The, to talk about that, that bridge over to religion also, like, you know, the, uh, um, the Islamic State and Islam in general was really interested in science. And so they really helped to fuse and they went looking back at the Greeks and what the Greeks were able to produce and looking at math. And they had religious reasons for doing that. But there you have that appreciation for uh, philosophy, which led to that golden age and that flourishing of Islamic culture, which is after our time period. But um, still, you just see that philosophy, that thread that's going to run through all of human history. It's an important legacy for sure. And kids... Just remember, if you're like, what the, they're talking so abstractly. You know what? Socratic method. True. Like the Socratic there you method. go. Okay. Yeah. There. Ask questions. Ask questions. No direct answers unless all the other solutions have been ruled out. Man, I do that with my kids all the time. When they ask a question, I'm like, let me ask a question back at you. And it's like, ah, oh, Socrates, you son of a bitch. You were right. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> you son of a bitch. <laughs> all righty. Matt, I think it's your pick. All right. Next one I'm going to go up with is uh, kind of related to a lot of the ones you've been talking already. Uh, and Corey actually mentioned it a little bit earlier that goes along with his writing, which is I'm going to go with like law codes. Oh. Specifically, I got to give a shout out to Hammurabi's code. I mean, the most well-preserved and most extensive legal code in all of ancient history. Right. That combined a little bit of Akkadian and Sumerian old laws from Written old Babylon. Um, yeah, it is written in cuneiform. You are correct. But kind of on this whole idea of like, how do we organize what people do, what they can and cannot do, where they live, what's acceptable in society, like this whole idea of like social norms that are still very much applicable in our day and age today. Well, you have to date back to what ancient peoples were thinking, sometimes incorporating either math, philosophy, or how you're developing cities, which is let's write down specifically what people can and cannot do. So the law codes is essential. It, it outlines more like a just and kind of base like level of understanding of what, again, what can you and can you not do? So, And to add on to what you were saying about the code of Hammurabi, I mean, that stuff is, you know, I mean, it's still discussed in law school today. Oh, absolutely. Right. It's definitely influenced our judicial system down to the present day. 
from the 1795 BCE. That's impressive, right? It's had a lasting impact. I mean, think how revolutionary that is in a way, right? You build your first cities, and then after a couple thousand years, you're like, hmm, I wonder if we should you know, formalize some rules. Yeah, there's got to be some rules here, right? <laughs> Jerry down the street's a real a-hole. We Jerry gotta keeps keep him killing in check. his neighbors. You know, we need an eye for an eye thing. Yo, that's a good rule. Let someone write that down in cuneiform. Can we get that? I know. What What is it? It's like the golden rule, treat others the way you want to be treated. Well, thanks, Hammurabi. We appreciate you for that one. Yeah. yeah. And what what's the, uh, like, because uh, some of the, the Hammurabi stuff uh, can connect to religion and sorry to do another thing where I'm trying to connect something to religion, but um, is like when, when it comes to like the 10 commandments, let's say, which is another sort of like uh, code, right? Like so how to, how you're supposed to behave. I don't know the history as far as like, do we see religious rules and codes that then influence laws or is it laws that influence uh, religion or are they just kind of at the same time? I don't know. Do you guys have, Oh, that's a good question. I, I'd have to assume that there has to be just some kind of general linkage between the two consistently, where it's like a trade-offs. Religion influences yeah. laws, laws influence religion, and they kind of go back and forth depending on what's the most prevalent ideology at the time. Well, and you have like a lot of the kings that you had mentioned that might might be writing these laws are also going to be gods in of themselves, yeah. right? They're gonna there's gonna be that Or if of- they have like, you know, that kind of that high priest figure that's part of like the royal court in whatever civilization mm-hmm. you might be looking at, that person is definitely has the ear of the royal family, the king, the queen, whatever that might be, and they're influencing their decisions along the way by saying this is what the god or gods want you to do because you are the representative here on earth. Yeah, yeah. Yo, the code of Hammurabi also, it looks cool. It's like a black Stella. Um, it's a bit phallic. It's a bit phallic. <laughs> but it's it's really cool looking. Um, Incredibly well preserved. You know, as, as influential as it was, I got to say, an eye for an eye, that could cause more issues. Yeah, they didn't really think about like the longevity of that one, did they? Right? I mean, you know, I don't know. That's, ooh. Ah, that can get like your neighbor has an affair with your wife. All right. I'm coming after your wife. We're going to have some weird non-consensual affairs. The laws say it. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't seem problematic. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So it's my turn. It is your turn. (laughs) Uh, Okay. Well, I'm thinking about, you know, Matt. Everyone seems to be going for legacy here. Um, so I want to go for a legacy item. So I'm going to go with the reforms, man, the reforms of Cleisthenes, the constitutional reforms of Cleisthenes around 508. Um, so hey, that's eight years past 500. <laughs> no, this is BCE. Oh, BCE. Okay. Uh, so Cleisthenes. Can you spell that Cleisthenes for me? C-L. E I S T H E N E S. Kind of a classic ancient Greek name. Um, Cleisthenes uh, came to power after a, a series of, I, I guess, what they, what the Greeks and Romans would have called tyranny, right? Um, <clears throat> so, kind of rule by one or one faction. Um, and, um, which wasn't always a bad thing, right. But, but could be, and it was. And so there had been, uh, traditionally in Greece rule by a few clans, um, and it was hereditary and they would take political office, um, and, you know, on a family basis. Um, and so what Cleisthenes did was he spread this out over, um, in, instead of your role being hereditary, first of all, he gave, Uh, citizenship to all free male citizens because the Greeks were a slave state, right? Um, So not everyone was free. Um, So all free male citizens, first of all, had citizenship. And then uh, you would be appointed randomly if you were a free citizen to political office. Um, And you could have a, a say in laws that are passed. Ultimately, so a form of early democracy. This is um, hugely important 
in our society, right? I mean, there's no doubt the founding fathers looked back to Greek and Rome, um, you know, even though their democracies were very flawed, right, in nature. Um, they looked back to them for influence, right, for these initial institutions that then developed over the course of time into what we have today, into like a parliamentary system or a federal system or whatever you have. So, um, yeah, Cleisthenes reforms, 508. So like kind of like the, the a little bit of like the, the early days of them formulating eventually like a Athenian democracy. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it literally created the Athenian democracy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's incredibly historically and, like, just in terms of, like, the magnitude of importance in human civilization. That's pretty damn big, yeah. Yeah. The whole idea of that we collectively can make decisions, mm -hmm. right? People always talk about the Republic of Rome, but I don't know. The senatorial class in it was Rome. still caste-based. Yeah. Yeah. So this is... This is this feels more significant for for an in influence in dem democracy. Yeah, and it's like if you know, you still had to have some kind of significance, but you didn't have to have. It wasn't like you had to be the upper echelon of society to have a have a voice at least. Yeah, and how I don't know how interesting to make like this is pretty unique to just say okay, you you were not born into an important family, but you're equal. To mm -hmm. that guy over there. Right. As long as you're a free citizen. Right. You are equal now. Yeah. That's revolutionary in in many ways. That just didn't exist before. No. Righteous. Yeah. Corey, you have your second pick finally. Yes. Uh, very, very exciting stuff. Um, we, we wouldn't have any of these things. And I guess here is where the sort of, for me, the, the, mar the, line of demarcation as far as how far back we can go. Uh, we wouldn't have any of these things if it wasn't for highly productive agriculture. Mm. Um, and so as far as turning points go, uh, you're not, you're not doing any writing or developing writing or stumbling into math, whether it exists a priori or not. Uh, but it, 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 you need to be able to feed people. You need to be able to eat and not have to just go make your own food. So as you have fewer and fewer people, producing food to feed everybody else. Um, it gives more people more time to do stuff. Mm. Um, what's that? I said, mm. 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 Delicious. I mean, yeah, I mean, cool. yeah, it's, it's okay, but you don't have like you, you're saying productive agriculture. You don't have productive agriculture until you have a calendar. You need the calendar to have productive agriculture. That was the whole cell of mm. calendar. Mm. That was why I picked mm. it. Because mm. without um, that calendar, would, you're not you're not tracking seasons. You're not <laughs> mm, mm. like that's the whole basis uh, would, of the calendar. Chicken before the egg. <laughs> yeah, I would say that uh, once you figure out that you can even grow stuff, then you're going to start trying to figure out when the stuff grows. So I would say that you're going to see agriculture before you start seeing calendars. Oh yeah, I'm not uh, saying you don't, but you you're not saying agriculture. You said oh. productive agriculture. Like, ah, okay. like I, I, that's why I'm saying I think productive agriculture doesn't happen until you have the calendar because that is what makes the calendar like a boom for civilizations. It Got allows it. them to streamline agriculture. It allows them to grow more with fewer hands. That's why I'm saying like diverse. That's why I was talking about diversification of jobs within society after the calendar blow up versus like just agriculture. Yeah, definitely super important productive agriculture though i feel like you're kind of like taking my pick without saying calendar that's the, the same it. they're the same well let's 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 be specific here are we talking about neolithic revolution right neolithic agricultural revolution eleven thousand yeah. seven hundred years ago in which case this is vastly important and led to the need for a calendar for sure and that that's what i'm saying i feel like that's the pick he's just picking agriculture as Discovery of agriculture. It led to people hanging out in larger groups, right? It led to the consolidation of power who would hoard food and then distribute it. It led to the creation of cities, mm -hmm. uh, the need to organize resources through a, a system. Is your, is your agriculture pick? Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. Is this a, are you picking the Neolithic Revolution? 
Well, I, I mean, yes, but you don't, but you don't get, but you don't get two I'm, for one. I, I'm, I'm picking, I, I'm picking, uh, I mean, we could get even more intense, like as far as like how productive agriculture comes. Uh, I'm not just talking about, like I am talking about agriculture as, as a development of agriculture, which is a, a new technology that develops over time. Um, I did say productive agriculture in the sense that a person is producing more food than they can eat. And so it is then feeding other people so that other people don't have to do anything. So that's what I'm getting at. I did use the word productive and that's what I mean by productive um, is that it's that, that people can feed other people, which is going to give those other people time to develop new technologies um, and uh, develop um, sort of new New, new social structures and, and all kinds of things that are going to be dependent on the, the fact that not as many people need to be used to produce a f- food. So sounds um, like the Neolithic uh, revolution. <laughs> so, so, so productive agriculture, I mean, there, there, there was, you know, in the, in the sort of like window of time, depending on what river civilization we're talking about, you do have people producing uh, food and, and growing it intentionally. So they're not moving around anymore. Um, so that is the, the sort of beginnings of agriculture, but the idea that, um, and you still have a lot of people that are producing that. So like the Jared diamond, um, he goes to, is it, is it Papua New Guinea? Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and he's, and he's looking at those folks and, and the, 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 um, vegetables or whatever, I can't remember what they're growing. It might be sorghum, um, but I can't remember what it is, but anyway, it's super labor intensive. And so basically you still need everybody to kind of like be involved in the growing of that food, um, as opposed to the ability of, of one person to be able to then feed more than just themselves. So that's the, the separation is that in what Jared Diamond is seeing in Papua New Guinea. And one of the reasons why they don't have as much cargo as it says in the, in the book and in the movie, um, is because they're not, they, they, they have agriculture, but they're not able to produce more for other people. They still have to have sort of all hands on deck intentionally growing and then harvesting that food. Cool. So I'll stick, I'll stick with yeah. agriculture. Neolithic revolution is what I was getting at. I did say highly productive <laughs> I, or I said productive. Uh, and so, yes, I, 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 I see where you're, where you're coming from there, sir. Um, <laughs> but right on. That's a good first half y'all. Good job. Let's get into this halftime. Halftime. And for halftime, Dylan has a question to ponder. Okay, so we're all historians here. We teach history. No, I don't. Um, well, <laughs> okay. We, but you could. You could yeah, if I you could. wanted to. You have. You have. You have, yeah. Um, and we love history here, right? So my question is, what got you into history? I'll go first. So uh, y'all know I grew up Catholic, right? I read, I was reading the stories about little baby Jesus and uh, the Old Testament, all that stuff. And specifically in the time of Jesus, it's around the time of Rome, which a lot of that stuff correlated to what I was learning in ancient history class. And so then I got into Rome um, from the stories of Jesus Right. And then from there, it just expanded. Um, And some video games like kind of fed into that, like medieval total war, age of empires, things like that. And then I had a thirst for knowledge and just kind of went at it. And uh, so that's when my interest in history started, oddly enough, from uh, my Catholic upbringing. What what about you guys? Uh, Well, I'm trying to think back. I think the earliest I could think about being interested in history from like a learning perspective was probably like my sophomore year of high school. I had an amazing teacher who taught world history and it was the ancient world history too. So we focused mostly on Greeks, Romans, like ancient China, like a bunch of things I had never learned before. And he, he made it really compelling in a way that was much more of like you were kind of like a traveler and you were trying to pick up what all these different civilizations had done throughout history and really experiencing it in like a much more like interesting way that I was like, man, I've never learned this before. Like you're always force fed, like either your local history or your national history, but you don't really learn too much about world history. And then moving on to college, 
you continue that because you have these professors who are just like, this is their world. Like they are the expert in ancient Near East and they will sit down. It might not be the most engaging style of learning, but they'll tell you a story for two hours, twice a week about everything you could possibly want to know about Hammurabi's code or the Hittites, right? Like, and just go into such extreme detail. You're like, wow, I, I never knew any of this. So there's a combination of like, I had really great people teach me it that made me interested in it. I found out that I was really good at it. And then you kind of go into a further down the path. Like, what can you do with it? Well, I mean, why did I get involved and in interest in this first place? I had amazing people that taught me. So, you know, I want to put that back forward. So that's kind of how I got interested in it. Nice. Corey, what got you uh, interested? Yeah, for me, it was, um, so it was, uh, it was actually other topics. Uh, so in my, my favorite, my junior year, my favorite uh, high school class was psychology. And then as part of that, you learn the sort of history of psychology, like the development over time. Um, and then there was, uh, I was a geography major. And so, and I did some, some, uh, English lit stuff. And with all of those, there's always had, you always have to get context. And so the history behind why this happened or why this is the way that that is. And, and so whether it's geography or, or books, uh, there always has to be this element of what, what came before it to give context. And so as I kept doing that, I just sort of like got more interested in history and, and always wanting to know, well, and answer that question. Well, why, why is it like that? Why did that happen in that way? Uh, and so it was sort of like other things were the, were the gateway drug. So I did, I wouldn't really say I got into history until, um, probably when I started working on my, my geography stuff and geography degree. And then all of a sudden it sort of like that started to build to the point that, you know, I ended up then teaching history, uh, as part of the program. So looking at English, lit, which was the thing I was originally planning to teach. Um, but then I just really enjoyed teaching the context behind the books and well, why is this person writing about this thing, the, the way that they are and, and what is going on in history that makes these people behave in these ways or treat each other like this or whatever. So, um, always having that context was, was something that kind of lit my fire. The context. I agree yep. with that. Yeah. Yeah. What took me into history was the internet and aliens. <laughs> <laughs> not playing in high school and early college. Did not have great history teachers. Did not make it interesting. And then I left college for a little bit. And at, at this time, it was like late 2000s, approaching like that 2012 date. And like all this alien stuff's out there and the internet is not friendly. And in high school, like we're that early internet generation. Yeah. And yeah. so, like, the focus of our classes wasn't on how to source stuff. You know, like, we learned it, but most of our stuff was still coming out of books. Yeah. Sourcing out of books and the internet are very different. So, I mean, had to learn the hard way. <laughs> thought, thought aliens were coming. And then that led to me going back to school. But then I got good teachers out at Green River. Mm -hmm. and it was like Latin American history took something that was way different. And, wow, it's so much more interesting than American history yep. or than U.S. history. Um, but then that along with anthropology, cause anthropology was going to provide the answers that like refuted all the alien shit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 It's like mm -hmm. aliens created the pyramids. Well, hold oh, up. Hold up. There, no, boss. Let's, yeah. let's look at that. And then that led to like an interest in religious anthropology and archeological anthropology. So yeah, uh, crazy shit on the internet, I think. And then good teachers. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Great Don't question. To life. Yeah. Yeah. Great question, Dylan. Let's hop back into the draft, but first, give us a recap, sir. All right. Corey has cuneiform as a writing system and uh, a productive agriculture, maybe the Neolithic Revolution, maybe not. <laughs> uh, I have the first cities um, from the Fertile Crescent and Cleisthenes, Democratic Reforms. Man has math and uh, Hammurabi's code. And Ben has the creation of the calendar and uh, blanket philosophy. I would just say discovery, like a discovery blank, philosophy. Blank check for philosophy. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's <laughs> disco discovery of math, <laughs> discovery of philosophy. We should push back harder on that. <laughs> just can't get a blank check for philosophy. I'm, I'm, well, does it, <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Does it shut the door on religion? I'm not taking anything religion. Okay. If that'd be asked, that'd be like asking, oh, since you have writing, do you get religion? But there was religions before you had writing. Yep. It was just communicated. Right. Anyways, okay, yeah. Okay. Round three. Yep. <laughs> there we go. Round three.
Corey, you have round three. Uh, all right. Um, my my list here. I'm I'm gonna have to go with uh, the development of metallurgy as a technology. It had to be done. Um, and I'm looking through to make sure I'm not stepping on any other toes. Um, I, you know, we we categorize history into eras um, like. There's the Stone Age, uh, but then you have the Bronze Age and you have the Iron Age. Uh, and so you have these these metals that kind of define eras of what humans are capable of accomplishing and doing. And so much of it is just the tools that we use. And so, what you know, we are only able to do as much as the as the tools enable us to do. We can only do so much with our with our own hands. And so, you know, looking at um, my previous amazing pick, uh, agriculture. I mean, one of the things that is able to make agriculture so intense in addition to understanding the seasons with a calendar <laughs> is being able to uh, make pl- like plows and yeah. being able to then uh, hook up that metal plow onto a beast of burden and being able to cut into the land. And so um, being able to produce things that will last, that are strong, um, that you can shape them into exactly the, the shape that you need. I mean, I think just metallurgy is is huge when we're looking at societies and we look at the spread of technology, metal and the, the spread of metal technology is one of those sort of like markers of advancements that we use to gauge where a civilization is at when we're looking at it historically. So metal well, on that and then you just have the advent of like weapons that co- coincides mm-hmm. with it yes about yes. it's it's yep. professional you, armies yeah and you start especially in ancient near east man they are fighting like basically every single year like there was a new war that had happened because they encroached on different boundaries that were not very well defined so yeah incredibly significant nice pick very nice um man I feel like I got to go with this one. The crucifixion of Jesus. The crucifixion of Jesus H. Christ. Um, what is Jesus H- Christ. What does is, what is the H stand for? Who knows? Um, man, I feel... Okay, so I was thinking about this last night. I was like, what? Like, the life of Jesus is obviously important, right? And historians know, like, okay, a person named Jesus existed... And then it was written down like decades later, right? And I just feel like this is this is the moment that set whoever this person was kind of apart from the other folks running around claiming to be the Messiah, right? The person who would come down in, in the Jewish faith and and save everyone from what then became this concept developed by St. Augustine kind of later of original sin, right? So Jesus, um, his crucifixion, somewhat unique, like God coming down as a son dying for everyone. That's very interesting. Um, and, and also this concept of Jesus as being crucified because he was a threat to the Roman state. Also interesting. Um, and what makes it significant is obviously the development of Christianity through then the resurrection as well right? This other kind of development that they wrote about, but the crucifixion itself, I mean, you can't ver like, you can't verify a resurrection. That's, I don't know. That's a weird thing to verify. (laughs) They wrote about it, but it's like, okay, but like dying on the cross and then writing about that, that's very significant. He became a martyr. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then develops like the largest religion ever. Yeah. Up to this point. Right. With what, with some, like close following, like Islam, very huge. Um, but Christianity just kind of swept the world, especially through its its message of like, well, God put the world here for you to sow your oats on, um, so go spread my message, right? Kind of, um, yeah, I mean, and, and, and Christianity is, is obviously influencing our politics today, right? So, um yeah, I, I don't know, man. I mean, I, I'll never forget when I, I was taking a road trip last summer or the summer before going through Utah, and there was a sign that said, OBEY in all caps, and then in small letters, JESUS. <laughs> <laughs> OBEY HIM. Yeah. So, crucifixion of Jesus, I think this is a monumental point in history um, that that changed the course of Western civilization. Well, and the irony is that, like, 
he gets crucified, and then later down the road, the Romans adopt Christianity as the official state religion. Yeah. Like, just the pure irony of that. They, like, they're like, get this guy out of here. And then fast forward, all right, fine. We'll be Christians now. <laughs> Only took, like, about 300 years. Yeah, for it took them to a do. couple hundred years, but yeah. they got there. Yeah. <laughs> no, pretty important pick, though. It's a pretty... Uh, pretty significant moment in time in human history for sure i mean the fact that we defined historical time periods as bc and ad like, yeah you know zero. and only just recently had we adopted the bce and ce right yeah but, but it still follows yeah, his life like yeah year zero you know yeah so pretty crazy it's pretty crazy all right, on to me. Uh, a little bit of a different road here, or should I say lack thereof, because I'm going with the advent of sailing. Sailing is a monumentally important thing in terms of human history, especially for ancient history. Uh, it kind of, depending on where you look, you'll find differing opinions on who really started this. Was it the ancient Egyptians around 4,000? Was it some of the ancient Greeks around 35 to somewhere 35 to 3000 BCE. There's no real clear like answer to that question, but ancient peoples basically said, you know, there's a body of water here. What if we could get down and up the body of water? Right? So this whole idea of sailing to not only get to natural resources, maybe down the Nile or, or up river or something along those lines, but also this is the basis for what will become trade because there is a civilization down or up river. And I'm going to get to them and I'm going to inquire about what they have, what I have, and can we facilitate an agreement that will be beneficial to us both. And then if you're thinking about longevity wise, sailing is, it's everything. That's how you have the world is discovered. And, and basically the world becomes colonized for centuries later because sailing lays the foundation of peoples that want to go out and find what's out there. Whether their intentions are good or bad, sailing is the basis for discovery. That, that, that is what it is. You cannot get anywhere without boats. So whether it be Egyptians or Greeks, that advent of sailing changes the game. It helps facilitate trade. It puts communities in contact with one another that might not have been possible before. It revolutionizes warfare down the road. It, it, how do you have the strongest military in the world? You have to have a strong Navy. That's always been the basis. All right. So yeah, the advent of sailing, pretty damn important. Don't forget the sea people yeah. leading to the Bronze Age collapse. <laughs> yeah. Who were they? We don't know. They came from the sea. It's all about seafaring folks. Yeah. Boats are big. Boats are important. Boats are pretty big and pretty important. But you know what's more important than boats? The advanced use of the wheel and wheel bearing. Mm. America's beg to differ, but please go on. What, the wheel and the, the wheel, advanced use of wheel with a wheel bearing? I mean... They got along without it in the Americas. We get advanced, then we get like the earliest potting wheel or the earliest potter's wheel. We get chariots from that, which is ad, like advancing warfare, your ability to also cover a lot of ground. Oh, yeah, development of roads. Come on. Mm-hmm. Like without that wheel bearing and the advancement of the wheel, we're not talking just a rudimentary wheel. We're talking about the wheel with the wheel bearing. That is my draft. That's my pick. Because then roads pick up, then roads are developed from township to township, city to city, we're starting to get that connective tissue that you need to lead to the Silk Road. Doesn't happen without that bearing, baby. Doesn't happen. Mill wheels don't happen without that bearing. So the movement of water, the way we harness energy with water, the way we facilitate the movement of water, agriculture-related, making productive agriculture... Got to have that. Yeah. You got to have that. <laughs> you got to have it. You got to have it. That's a pretty important one. Yeah, parts of your boat aren't going to work without that bearing, baby. <laughs> got to be able to move that sail. It doesn't just swivel. Pulleys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any anyone have any thoughts on that? Or no, I mean uh, the I wheels mean, important. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I will not. I I I am jesting when I say the like I'm push my pushback, but. Uh, you know, I mean, the Amer- like the Inca did fine without a wheel. They, they, they did great. You know, they had roads. They had a sweet road system. So you don't need the wheel. But it's, it's more about the Inca- geography major, Corey, right? It's about what mm. your geography demands, right? And our, in, in the Fertile Crescent, it, it demanded 
a wheel, right? I mean, yeah, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about the Inca. I know. Well, I yeah. just I want to offer a little <laughs> pushback. A little bit. I mean, like, what'd you pay? You, your formation of cities doesn't even address the Inca. Like, you're only talking about the Fertile Crescent. I'm just giving a little pushback. Your pushback's un, unwarranted. <laughs> it's unwanted. <laughs> you pick the crucifixion of Christ, and then you're like, and therefore I get the whole religion <laughs> <laughs> as stems from it. <sighs> okay, well, we need to get to one more ad. We're sponsored by Barry's. Berries, baby. We've heard from them before, but they got a new product for us. This is Mount Draftmore. Mount Draftmore. Hey there, folks. This is Barry again. This time to talk to y'all about our latest bow and arrow. We at Berries offer several varieties of bows and arrows to suit your beast hunting needs. We have it all. All kinds of wood for you to choose from, including birch, maple, oak, cedar, pine, palm, beech, composite, Douglas fir, redwood, we here at Barry's guarantee you will be satisfied with your bow as we've been in business since 10,000 BCE. So next time you need to slay a wild saber tooth, come on down to Barry's and pick up any of our arrowheads as we have all kinds, including iron, copper, steel, adamantium, unobtainium, dragonglass, vibranium, unicorn ivory, gold, silver, moon rock, and lead. These will take down any beast or man in cold blood. So come on down to Barry's today. Okay, push back after the wheel pick. Can't believe I'm getting it in the fourth round. Matt would call this a value pick. You have to take pottery. You have to take pottery. It, it could have been in the first round. We're talking 19, or 29,000 years ago. First ceramic pots discovered in China. Obviously, those weren't formed with a wheel. Those were uh, coil pots. Then you start, because you have pottery after the, the foundation of agriculture, oh shit, we have somewhere to put our grain. What are you going to do? You're going to put all your crops in a pile? Yeah. <laughs> they did that for a, for a half a second. Then you know what happened? Wildlife got to it. You can't have people just guarding your crops all day. That, that's not a good use of labor. But you start putting them in pots, and then you establish granaries. Okay. Talking about 95 Ninety five nine thousand five hundred BC. You start to see burials have pottery nine thousand years ago, specifically in Turkey. Come on, pottery. Come on, come on, pottery. Yeah, the first Stor pottery was found in twenty nine thousand BC in the Czech Republic today. There we go. I could have worded that better, but y'all got my point. We got the point. Got the point. You need pottery. You do need pottery. You yeah. need pottery. That's how you store all your stuff. It's you're, a need. You're carving shit. Where are you going to put all your cool little carvings? You got to store well, and it. Move, and move it, too. Like, if you're going to, whether you're on a boat or in a cart, for you wheel and sail uh, guys out there, <laughs> like, you've got to store all that and, and keep it in something in order to transport long distances. And now you can take it more than a handful in your pottery. But, you, yeah. but it also allows you to stay put. Pottery yes. allows you to stay put. Like now, you don't have to be a hunter gatherer society. Like you can establish a city. You don't get to establish a city unless you get to bank load enough food to stay in that spot. Your that reserves, happens with pots. Yeah. Put your grains in a pot, and then we're talking again, like back to the productive agriculture because you're getting to store all that less hands on deck in the fields. Yep. Diversification of labor. We get more fun jobs. This, yeah, this is true. How did it make it to the fourth round? It's a it's a good it's a good value in the fourth. It's good a value, value pick. For sure. Don't worry, Matt, we're all angry with ourselves for not getting it earlier. Don't you worry. I feel like I need, <laughs> I needed that pick after Dylan attacked. I'm sorry. He viciously attacked the wheel bearing yeah, pick. Reel it in. He's like, I don't need a wheel bearing. You couldn't without a without yeah. a wheel bearing. You don't even get to reel in the fishing pole. You're still, you just got yeah, the string the on the line. stick and yeah. you have to pull the line. That's true. That's true. No doubt. No doubt. No doubt. You need bearings, bro. <laughs> Dylan, the bearing hater. <laughs> Matt, it's your last pick. All right, last one. I'm going to go with the, you, I mean, it's, I think it's a pretty good value pick in the last round as well, which is masonry. Masonry. I mean, come on. We're, we don't live in caves or huts anymore. Thanks, Masonry. You made that possible. It's that whole idea of 
hey, we want to develop the cities, right? But are we all going to be sleeping on the ground under like straw mats? Probably not. So we actually need to build the cities. Well, how do you do that? You have to go through masonry, people that can actually shape different types of stone and build vertically, right? This is this is key. This is how they build the pyramids. This is how they build the aqueducts. They have to have some expertise in masonry. And that takes us from, again, just a little collective tribal communities that live very, very close to one another in natural formation. So now, hey, the city makes a lot of sense if we build it near the river because the river is the lifeblood of of agriculture, natural resources, trade, you name it. Well, it's just kind of flat land. We can't, we don't really, what are we going to do about that? Well, let's use some masonry and let's actually build some damn buildings. And the fact that ancient peoples were so damn good at this, using some, most of the time using math to make such beautiful architectural, like just buildings and, and shrines and temples and, and formations. It, it blows my mind to think how technically precise something like the pyramids of Giza are or how, like just spot on the Acropolis was or anything in ancient Rome from the aqueducts to the Colosseum. So yeah, masonry, pretty damn important. Wow. Wow. Yep. How the fuck are you going to attack me for philosophy, (laughs) discovery (laughs) philosophy, but then you're like, yeah, masonry. Mm." (laughs) Makes sense. I'm talking to you, Dylan. I'm talking to you. I just hope our listeners are enjoying this conversation Um, and uh, all the twists and turns. Um, I'm going to take a more humble approach to my fourth round pick. I'm going to take. You're just bypassing Matt's pick. You're like, I'm not even going to address it. I'm going to take a a uh, just a fun fourth round pick. Something that I would not have taken in the first round. Okay, I've learned my lesson. I've grown as a drafter, y'all. I'm taking the Grocky brothers, um, the, the senatorial, the Senate had pretty much become a class just of equestrians, which were kind of like the upper classes, right? Born into that through, I guess you could call it nobility if you want to, um, not much, you might call it like working class representation. So the Grocky brothers were trying to undermine the system to reform it, um, to make it more equitable. They were social activists, right? Um, uh, they were killed. They they didn't succeed. But it was a cool moment in history. It's I think it's seminal because it's like, how many moments in ancient history do you learn about people who are trying to represent the lower class like that? It's they were starting they were trying to like start a revolution. Oh uh, the yeah, the Gracchi brothers it, it is such a fascinating and it's pretty damn tragic too. About yeah, they were really just <clears throat> like men of the people that wanted average was it was it plebeians? Yeah, pl- yeah, plebeians to have a say in how Rome was run. Yeah. And the upper class predictably did not like that. No, of course not. And they were assassinated. Yeah, they were killed. And um, yeah, I don't know. I think this is a seminal moment in history again because in ancient history, it's I'm hard-pressed to think of a moment where like, you get such a uh, detailed look at people representing the working class. Oftentimes in ancient history, the people you're hearing from are either from like a religious class that wrote things down, right? Or they're from an upper class who had the luxury, the resources to write things down. Um, you're not really hearing about or from the working class. Yeah, so, but how does this like reverberate into the future? Okay, some people stood up for the lower class. They got killed. And like... The- Dylan's a people person. Look at his picks. He has Cleisthenes with the reforms in Greece. He has Jesus. He's a people guy. And now he's got a couple of brothers in Rome. He just, he he sees people as being the center of human history. I do. He's a man of the people. I do. (laughs) He's a man of the people. The people's champ. Cities. I hear. Urban environments full of people. Yeah. I love people and I love learning about people. (laughs) It's, I think they're, they're super interesting. I don't know. And uh, it's again, there's not many moments like this. You know, you don't hear about the extermination of the Gauls from the Gauls perspective. You hear about it from Caesar's very biased kind of propaganda that he created. Right. Um, so I don't know. I think that this is a really unique piece of history. And that's what makes it seminal. The, the fact that we're talking about it right now. I wouldn't have ever talked about it if you hadn't brought it up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've literally never heard about any of this. So I'm just like, how significant is it if I've never heard of you it? You can't see kind of the basis for like how a lot of, you know, 
20th, 19th, 20th century, or even probably a little bit 18th century politics are run based off of you always have a candidate, at least one, who's going to appeal to the masses in mm-hmm. one way, shape, or form. And they are the guys that really kind of start that. Yeah. Unsuccessfully, but yeah. Yeah. You know, because you do have other populist leaders, like Caesar was a populist leader, right? But he Who, was a noble. That, that, was that, a, that's just a different, it's apples and oranges. And see, that's the issue, right? He's a noble and and he's really just appeasing the people. He's not actually yeah. doing anything to reform the system in their benefit. He's appeasing them, right? No, so he's, that's he's a, he strives for power, right. but he knows he needs to support the people to achieve that. That is what, and and that, you know, and who knows what the Roman system would have been like had they succeeded, yeah. you know, I don't know. Did they make a lasting impact? No. Are they important in the history of studying social reform? I do believe they are, yes. And so I'm going to put them down. They're already down. You couldn't take them back if you and wanted. As stuck a fourth with it. round. <laughs> done. People's champ. Yeah. That's not even Band true. Other people. What the hell? People's oh, champ. that's what you mean. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Corey, your last pick. <laughs> Yeah, uh, w- w- uh, real quick, uh, n- not so much as a recap, but, um, you know, there's a, there's so much uh, overlap in so many of these things. So, uh, you know, I, I was crossing off things because it's like, well, I can't really do religion because philosophy, too much overlap. Um, I was going to do trade, but then sailing. Also, uh, Matt, uh, in my last draft that I was a part of, I also chose sailing hey, by Christopher Cross. Sailing away. <laughs> sailing away. Um, and so suddenly that, that kind of stepped on, on, on the, the shoes of trade. So start, and, and, uh, legal systems got rid of my emergence of the state. So all these things, and I didn't want anybody to come after me again for doubling up on their pick. So, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say slavery, uh, is, Damn. um, maybe a, uh, 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 what up, Mr. Man of the People? About- because you're a man of the people. <laughs> well, because D- when Dylan was talking about what's going on in Rome and the idea and, and sort of democratic reforms and people trying to be of the people, well, there was a lot of people that didn't have access to a lot of those things as they were slaves. And how many societies have been built up, you know, when we're talking about the cities who built a lot of those cities um, and who is doing some of the end up doing some of the hard work that would be involved in a lot of the things that we have here, like agriculture. Um, and so slavery is something that has changed the course of human history. People that have a lot of societies that have power, um, do it on the backs of slaves. Um, you have some very successful societies that had very little slavery. I think China would be uh, a key example of that where it's not prevalent like it is in other societies, but still, uh, especially in, uh, the Near East, um, we have, sl- and, and then with Rome also, uh, slavery helps to build those empires. So in all kinds of societies, whether we're talking about, like we had slavery here in North Pacific Northwest Native American societies, uh, we have slavery all over the world at different times, and uh, only, and we have it today too. I mean, it's still, it still exists in um, some forms, but just not, it's not legal anymore, um, but you still see it sort of, Per, as a as a pervasive thing just sort of under the radar now but yeah i would say slavery has been a huge um turning point in human history using people for their labor or and other things value pick in the fourth yep. round that's a that's a slam dunk to, to conclude it right there yeah only time you'll ever hear slavery and value pick together yep <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's important it's an important pick though like that yeah most of the basis of human history is built off of slave labor yep yeah, I know what slavery is. I don't know yeah. what the Grokey brothers are. <laughs> Gra- 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 yeah. Cuneiform. <laughs> what do you call Cl- it? Cuneiform. 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 Is it cuneiform? Is that how you say it? Oh, it's cuneiform. I always said cuneiform. Uh, I always said cuneiform. St. Louis. Portland. <laughs> <laughs> Something else was pronounced. Ah, it doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. That's that's all that of it. Yeah, yeah. We gotta make is. our cases now. Make, 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 make their case. Be logical and clear. Stepping up to the bat first is going to be Ben Jammin making his 90 second case. Ben, you ready? Yes, sir. I'm ready to win this shit. Let's get it. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I have four amazing, amazing picks. Okay, everyone else is going to be like, hey, all of my stuff is still in practice today. They got it from me. The calendar. We still use calendars today. Development 
of, or let's say, uh, early classical philosophy to rein it in for Dylan, right? <laughs> the use of advanced wheels and wheel bearings and pottery. <laughs> Look, calendars tell us what day it is. They help us track the seasons, and we, we use the stars early on. Come on, we're, we're exploring astronomy here with our first calendars, which allow us to really get our agriculture in line, right? Yeah, it's a, we're not just talking productive. We're talking extremely productive agriculture. What up, Corey? Next, we got philosophy. Hey, we're <laughs> contemplating everything because now that we have mass amounts of food and all this diversification of labor, hey, some folks get to sit back and really ponder what the universe holds, what's right, what's wrong, how things work. Thanks a lot, philosophy. Wheel bearings, they're helping us move stuff. Talking about trade through boats, let's talk about trade with carts. Let's talk about movement of, of units of war. That all happens with that wheel bearing. And you also have the roads. And then finally, pottery. You need pottery to store shit, to store the grains, to move the water, to stay in a location. Y'all, I'd vote for me. You should too, because all of this is still used today. Oh, a little smoochy smooch. Oh, they, they, they love it. <laughs> I can't help that. I'm the best. Wow. Yeah, you should be The feeling. hubris, exactly. as the Greeks would say. Yeah. The listeners are like, what's that word? Who are the, who are the Grokey brothers? Socrates. Matt, you ready? Yep, let's go. All right, recap my team here. I got math, or at least the discovery of math. Uh, law codes, so like Hammurabi's code. Advent of sailing, and then masonry. Let's start off with the math part. I mean, math is incredibly critical. You're talking about, hey, you want to develop cities? Well, you're going to need some math for that. Oh, you want to have this awesome calendar that's going to make your agriculture a little bit more perfect and productive? You're going to need a little bit of math for that one, too. You want to navigate? You're going to have to use astronomy, which bases itself through math. Law codes, I mean, this is basically how we organize what is acceptable and unacceptable human behavior. They had it a little bit differently than we do nowadays, but still that whole idea of here's the rules for being a member of the society. That is incredibly, incredibly important sailing. I mean, come on being able to to traverse like ocean rivers, you name it, lakes, whatever that might be, whatever waterway it might be. You, this is how you conduct trade. This is how you also get materials from point A to point B. This is how you start other points of discovery, engagement with different communities and civilizations. Sometimes it doesn't work out. Sometimes it leads to war. But you got to admit that the advent of sailing is crit- critical to the development of society and human history. And then masonry. I mean, come on. We don't live in shacks or caves anymore. This is because we've, over time, perfected the ability to make Houses, cities, buildings, monuments, temples, pyramids, whatever that might be. This whole idea of building up and out rather than that. I'd vote for me. You should too. Uh, you got it. Got Just it barely. Got yeah, it. It wasn't, it wasn't. It wasn't that good though. It wasn't clean no. though. Didn't stick the landing. I got nervous. It was like you, you came off the vault and you wobbled and took yeah. a step and then got back. Yep. Mr. Right. Man is ready. Who's, who's Mr. Man? I'm Mr. Man. The man of the people. Oh. That's right. Okay. Mr. Mann wants you to know that he chose first the first cities in 3500, Cle- Cleisthenes, Democratic Reforms in 508, the Gracchi brothers in 133, and Crucifixion of Jesus in 33 CE. Uh, first cities, y'all, we live in cities. Whether, whether you are in a small town or a giant city, you are living in an, an, a semi or an urban environment, right? And these... These development of cities have impacted us, the way we develop our lives, the way we think about the the way um, things are laid out, the resources we need from first cities. Cleosthenes democratic reforms. Man, unique. Everyone who's a free male citizen is equal. What? And you can participate in government? You're chosen to do that, in fact, at random? And, and then you participate based on region, not by tribe? Wow, that's pretty unique. Um, laying the origins of democracy. Cruz, uh, the Gracchi brothers, a unique instance in social justice. Amazing. Represent the people. Come on. Let's go. Right? Let's perfect that Democrat democracy. Now it's developed for a few hundred years. And then the crucifixion of Jesus. This is democratic in a way, too. Okay? Christianity is interesting. It's, it's, a, it's unique because God reaches down to the people instead of the people reaching for God. Listen, vote for me because I would. 
you even mention your last pick? I did. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mentioned every single one of them. I, I feel comfortable with, with my message. Man of the people. And you should too. Corey, are you ready to go? <laughs> I just want to say thank you for saving the best for last. I don't know if that was oh my uh, strategic or... No, that's just... Um, but I really appreciate it. It's because you had the first pick, which means you had the last pick, and it's oh. not fair to have the person who has the last pick then have to justify all their picks without oh. any kind of prep. Yeah. Whereas no, in I the like wraparound... My, I, like, yeah. I like saving the best for last better. Anyway, so let's go. <laughs> okay, um, with my first overall pick, uh, uh, writing... Uh, let's go through the, that, that first round again. Do you have cities without writing? No, you, you're not going to have an organized kind of society without being able to keep track of what's going on and be able to build a whole city on the engineering without, without writing and being able to do that math, maybe some rudimentary math, like, you know, some beads and stuff. But um, if we're going to take math to the point that it's going to be changing human history, you need, you need, you need to have some writing calendars, not a calendar. If you're not writing anything down, can't keep track <laughs> of stuff. So writing <laughs> fundamental, the basis for all of your picks. So I'm going to go ahead and call round one. A huge win for me. Um, moving on to my second pick. Oh, agriculture. Hang on. Let's go back. Let's go back to the first round real quick. Do we have cities without agriculture? No. Oh, God. it didn't even do that productive. Um, do we have math? No, because nobody's just hanging out. They're busy working to like make their own food. They're hunting. They're gathering. They're not producing any math. Um, do we have calendars? Without agriculture, nobody's going to be developing calendars. They're not going to be looking up at the stars. They're going to be making their food or getting the food or killing the food or whatever. So we're going to go ahead and call um, writing a huge, a huge win or uh, agriculture, a huge win there. Metallurgy, you need those tools to do all of the things. You're not building buildings um, without the metal tools to be able to do that. You, know, you don't have highly productive agriculture without metallurgy. So that pick is awesome. Um, and also, uh, you know, and my house isn't made of, uh, oh, I'm almost out of time here. Um cool. And also slavery. All of this stuff is built yeah, up on done. the back of slavery. Yeah, you're done. <laughs> he didn't stick the landing. Oh, uh, no. He's like, I had the very first pick. Therefore, every pick after the first pick is, is mute. mine. Eh. That's, a, that's a bad argument, bro. You lose on that one. It's fine. I won the draft, so it's okay. <laughs> you can't win when you piggyback everyone else's stuff, although slavery is a pretty good pick. I'll give you slavery. Jesus Christ. Never going to hear that, those words. No, that, was, that again. was your pick, Dylan. Yeah. You, Jesus you Christ was your that. pick. No, he didn't pick Jesus. He picked the murder of Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Murder of Jesus. Murder of Jesus. Jesus got killed. All right, y'all. Thank you, as always, for listening to the podcast. We're going to sit here and bicker some more after we get off about who won. But ultimately, that doesn't matter because we don't vote. You vote. You took the time out of your day to listen to us, and of course, we appreciate that. That blows our mind that you spend your free time listening to us. Thank you so much. Now, get on Instagram and vote for a winner. Search Mount Draftmore. Heck, follow Mount Draftmore. Mount is spelt out, M-O-U-N-T, Draftmore. Give us a vote every week. Give us a vote for who you thought won this week. Yes, make sure to look for us on Instagram at Mount Draftmore. Make sure to leave a review. Uh, stream us wherever you are able to wherever you stream your podcasts i don't know why i sound so subdued right now i don't know and i don't know why yeah. you said instagram after i just said instagram i'm not gonna lie i wasn't paying attention Go to, to what you're saying also check us out at gmail send us an email <laughs> yeah. at send, gmail. please send us an email we also have a twitter it's just at draft more if you want to hit us up on there since you want to slide into the dms that's totally fine we just want feedback yeah that's what you got yeah tell us a dirty story we'll read it yeah, tell us, what, <laughs> tell us what you think of the Groki. Groki? Grakai. Grakai. Yeah. Tell us yeah. about the brothers that you may have just learned about and your thoughts. They're cool. That's what people are going to only say they were cool. Tell us if you get the first round pick, if you really get to flex and be like, oh, your other first round picks ain't shit because they all connect to mine. But that's what makes the McDonald's pick the McDonald's, the McDonald's pick. pick. It's, yeah. it's a franchise right like, there. You would have had more respect if you didn't pick the franchise pick. And then you're like, hey, you know what? I know that that one's important. But look at these other dope ass shit. Nah, you just leaned into it. Yep. You were like yeah. Mickey Mouse. I'm not even going to consider Donald Duck. You made a mistake Full there. Full sense. Oh, damn. You that's didn't a... listen to that episode, did you? I did. Oh, okay. That's a throwback. Yeah, yeah. Throwback. Yeah, yeah. Disney that's characters? Early. Yeah. Hashtag. Okay. Well, anyway. I just have to say thank, thanks for having me. You can, you can try to I was to about to down. say that. I was, about, I was about to say. Corey, it is always a pleasure. Yeah. Yeah, always no, a pleasure. Thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come and record with us. We appreciate you as a guest. You're awesome, and you are a champion.
I love it. And thank you for uh, the flexibility for me to, to, to do this from uh, another location too. This is fantastic. I'm glad that this works. I yeah. can't wait to be back. Woo. Let's go. Woo. Woo. <laughs> I can't do that with my, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Take care y'all. Peace. Later. Cheers. <laughs>